welcome to my talk on the use of inquiry-based learning in A-level physics. I teach at an all-boys school in Kent with girls accepted into the sixth form. I teach mainly A-level classes so that's where a lot of my time and focus is spent. I love reading and keeping up to date with the latest educational research and then spending time implementing it into my lessons and then reflecting on how effective it has been. I also run a small educational research group at my school where we also focus on this but trying to roll it out to the wider curriculum. Over the past few years I have been trying to develop the A-level students problem solving and practical skills. After completing an exam analysis with my head of department we noticed two major skills lacking. Practical planning, especially for unknown practicals, and uh, problem solving which is an issue for us with our paper three which is synoptic and problem solving. So we discussed how to tackle this uh, and we decided that uh, we were going to try inquiry based learning. So this is where my three year project started with my students and this is what I'm going to be talking about to you today. So what is inquiry based learning? Well inquiry based learning is when as the teacher you ask the students a question or introduce them to a problem and then leave them to solve it on their own with very little guidance or input. This can be very hard for us as a teacher because it is in our very nature to guide them and help them. But the fact that you are leaving them on their own is all part of the learning process. So with inquiry-based learning, there is a lot of contro controversy around it, and mainly with the fact that you shouldn't really do it with novices. So I would like to look at how we are actually going to define a novice. So a novice would be defined as a student who has little or no experience in the subject. So I ask, are any of our students at A-level really novices? They have studied and got a good grade in their GCSE, this shows the level of understanding and knowledge in content as well as maths and practical skills. So I would argue that this would mean at A level none of our students can really de be defined as a novice except maybe in particle physics. So I would say that you can use inquiry based learning with your A level students without needing to worry. So let's talk about some of the benefits of inquiry based learning. For me, there are a lot of benefits to inquiry-based learning um, and the main ones, for example, are communication with peers about the topic. This is important because to communicate effectively with their peers, they need to explain their question or use explanations that their peers can actually understand. This involves a formulation of coherent, succinct, scientific answers, which is a skill that we all want our A-level students to have. It also helps develop their problem solving skills. If you give them a question and they know that they've got to get the answer and just leave them to get on with it, well then that develops their problem solving skills. Inquiry based learning can also improve their develop uh, can also develop their research skills. So one way in which you can do this is you can just give them a broad question and ask them to go away and answer it. And this can involve a lot of research on in textbooks and on Google. Another thing it's a, a benefit of inquiry based learning is development of practical skills. So these are all such important benefits of inquiry based learning, but I'm going to focus on the two that I have mainly been working on after the exam analysis, which are developing problem solving skills and developing their practical skills. Of course, as with every strategy that we use uh, in teaching, there are a few problems with uh, inquiry based learning and the main problem with inquiry based learning is usually because they don't know how to start. There are a few things you can do to help with this. These are two of the main things that I do. So I give students a poke or a nudge, not a literal poke or nudge, but a little educational poke or nudge. Um, and this is normally because they are getting used to and adapting to this way of learning. So quite often we wouldn't do this with a GCSE class, but we do all of a sudden they're in year 12 and we are throwing them into this new way of learning. 
also students are sometimes just not brave enough to go for it they don't like being judged or getting things wrong so to start off with they might just require a little nudge or a poke in the right direction sometimes they do this just by pointing at a page in a textbook or writing a word on their paper it's key that even when you are helping them you give them as little guidance as possible scaffolding is also very important with this skill when starting out with this or if you're doing it with a sort of a lower ability a level class some scaffolding can really really help them there are many ways in which i scaffold this task it can be as simple as putting up the final answer they're looking for on the board so they have an end goal and they know what they are working towards or giving them an initial hint to get them started or writing one or maybe even two depending how long the calculation is intermediate stages that they should be working towards and they can use as signposts that they are on the right lines even with this scaffolding you are still allowing them to develop the same skills and eventually I have found that even with the lowest of ability A level students I have been able to completely remove the scaffold so that they can all work independently on these skills. So I use acquire based learning in my lessons a lot and when you are doing query based learning it's important that they are not doing it on their own they're not having the so much support from the teacher so they do need to have support from their peers there are t multiple different ways to do this but I have found there are two really effective ways to do this one is to let them work with who they want now this can be a risky strategy I agree um, because maybe if you allow them to work with who they want they might not necessarily be in the best groups for them education wise and development wise however I have found that when they work with who they want they are happier to communicate and bounce ideas off each other as they are less embarrassed to be completely honest about their and open about their thought process and if you allow them to do it with their peers and who they want they are less scared of getting it wrong because your their friend is less likely to judge them or make fun of them than someone else in the class so there are certain situations and certain people with who I will just let them work with who they want and know that they are still going to achieve the end goal the other way I, I, I structure it is I make them to use specific groups and these groups need to be chosen before the lesson with a specific focus in mind and not just randomly as that helps no one so what I mean is by a specific group is for example I have done it in a, a mixed ability so I've got some really really high ability students and it might not be uh, grade wise it might be that they have a very very high ability to problem solve so I will put them with someone who is weaker at that skill. They might not be weaker academically, but in the skill I'm trying to develop them with, they are a weaker candidate. And that way, the higher ability student at this skill can really support that weaker student. And that helps develop the weaker student, but also helps that higher ability student to really, really understand what they are doing and the process behind it. I also have done specific groups that are by ability so this is academic ability specific especially if I know the topic we are doing is quite a difficult topic and the reason why I sometimes do it like this because I don't really like doing it like this but in certain topics it's needed so that I can scaffold and guide as needed for the weaker students than the higher ability students so this is a really good way to do it in a mixed ability class because you can have the same task and all the students get to the same end goal but I can give more guidance and scaffolding to the weaker candidates than the stronger candidates so as I said earlier after our exam analysis we realized that our students were actually quite bad at problem solving so I have been using inquiry based learning to develop these problem solving skills because as we know at A level developing the students problem solving skills is vital 
Uh, for my A-level course in particular, we have a whole paper that's a synoptic paper, which is based around problem-solving skills. And when I first joined my current school, the students were really bad at this. Uh, so I have looked at a few ways to deal with this. One is by using inquiry-based learning for problem-solving. So what I do is I give them a really hard exam question that links multiple topics and equations together and just leave, give it to them and leave them to work it out for themselves. Uh, I am quite mean. I will literally just give it to them and leave them to get on with it and suffer. But every single time they get to the end of the question and the look on their faces when they are so proud of themselves that they have got the final answer is just gives you a real buzz. And when doing this, it is key as a teacher to give as little help as possible. And I said it before, I know this goes against our values as a teacher, but the struggle to solve the problem is where they develop the problem solving skills. And it helps them to build stronger connections between the contents. Although I am mean, and I do give very little help, I will reassure them. I won't give them help as such with answering the question, but I will reassure them, and I often find myself saying, I know you can do it. I've taught you all the skills you need. You can do it. And this is often a good enough push for them to actually keep trying as they know that I believe in them. And then they do manage to get to that end step and that final answer. So this is an example of a question I give them. This happens to be my favourite question to give them. Um, I So far, the quickest that any of my classes have completed this in is about 10 minutes. Um, so if your class can do it in a faster time than that, I will be like, they are really good. So this is a question I give them. Um, and they find this question incredibly hard. Uh, and I think it's because, A, it's electric fields. I mean, most of you will know my pain. Uh, units have to be converted. They need to use multiple equations, and the equations come from different topics. So with this question, I let them do it in pairs or groups based on my earlier strategies that I've spoken about that I think will be the best way for them to actually obtain an answer because I don't want to knock their confidence. I want to do them to develop the skills. So once all the groups have got to the end, uh, I will model to them exactly how I would have approached it and done, and done it, including all of my thought process too. If they are finding it particularly difficult as a whole class, I will sometimes put a hint on the board, as uh, I've told you, as I mentioned earlier, or I will give a specific group a hint. Um, and for this particular question, I tend to give them an equation that they need to solve it, but not necessarily one that is obvious how to get to, because that way they still have to do some problem solving, but they are doing it with a goal. So another brilliant use of inquiry-based learning with our students is in developing their practical skills. As we all know, practical skills are vital for them, not only for passing their A-level, but for their future career prospects and preparing them for any science-based degree. One thing I have found is that despite all the practical skills they have developed through Keysa 3 and GCSE, if you give them all the equipment and a goal, they have no idea how to get there, despite having used all the equipment before and done a similar practical before. Again, I'm a meanie. With this, I will just give them the title of the practical, usually the PAG or the CPAC name, and then tell them they have all the equipment and all the practical skills they need to be able to achieve to do this practical and just leave them. I do, however, make them write me a method of how they will achieve this before I allow them to do the practical. I will then read their method and then help them if necessary or leave them to get on with it. The reason for this is exam practice. In exams, they are quite often asked how to write methods or do analysis for known practicals. And this helps them to understand and think about exactly what they are doing and why, meaning that in an exam, it is an easier thing for them to do. As well as being a meanie, the method of how I run my practicals has another purpose too. It helps them plan unknown practicals in the exam. So as I mentioned earlier, after exam analysis of Year 13 papers, it was noticed that they struggle to plan practicals which they haven't done. By making them plan the method in class before doing the practical, it helps them develop this skill. They have to consider the equipment they have and how they can use that to achieve their goal. 
Since starting using inquiry-based learning with them for practicals, the sick form have been getting a lot better at planning unknown practicals when it comes to tests and mocks. They are still not perfect, but then they never will be, and I wouldn't expect them to. But I have noticed one major thing. They are much more confident and will just have a go at the questions now rather than leaving them blank, which they did before. And this confidence boost, I feel, is so important as that is half of the battle with them and answering exam questions. If they feel confident enough to have a go, they will have a go and then they may be able to pick up marks. So that is a very quick tour and talk about what I have spent about three years working on. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you found it interesting and useful and that you are already thinking of ways you can use it in your classrooms with your students. If you want to discuss any of the ideas I've talked about today or hear a bit more about what I get up to, then you are more than welcome to follow me on Twitter. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.